Next, welcome the Chief Technology Officer at GE Renewable Energy, Danielle Murfeld. She's here with journalist John Donovan. Good morning and welcome, Danielle. Um, what I find really interesting about talking to a technologist from, General from GE, the GE is General Electric and General Electric is a massive company, the, an aircraft carrier of a company really that has roots in coal powered electrical generation. Thomas Edison was there at the start of General Electric and he built the world's first, the America's first power generating plant in New York City and it was driven by coal. So coal is in GE's story and yet now General Electric seems to be seriously trying to turn the aircraft carrier towards renewables. And tell me, tell me what's going on with that and where did the impetus come from and how far along is the company? Sure, so I'll start just by saying it's not the first time GE's done these big turns. Um, I, I came to GE about 20 years ago specifically to work on LED lighting to shift us from incandescence to LEDs, which mm. the company has made a huge pivot around. So this isn't new for us. We've been reinventing ourselves for over 120 years. Um, but where we are now is we have a GE renewable energy business that um, is global. We're in 140 countries, 40,000 employees, um, and we work across uh, mostly utility scale, not um, small scale uh, consumer scale, but we do um, wind power both onshore and offshore. We do solar um, inverters, we do storage systems, we do hydropower, hybrid systems. We even do work on the grid and how to run the grid in terms of software, but right. also HVDC, um, analytics, a lot of capabilities that use the power um, and distribute it to customers. So we, we just heard a panel discussion, as you said, on, on small scale. We were talking about Washington DC and consumer level decisions. Your customers are not, strictly speaking, in terms of what we're talking about, consumers, but, right. but the companies that, that build the power plants, that build the electrical grids, et cetera. And are you, are you getting I mean, it would seem that you're making the judgment that there's a strong market for, oh, yeah. for uh, renewable infrastructure. Yeah, so our customers are uh, range mostly utilities, but historically, most only utilities, but more increasingly, we're actually getting uh, large global companies that want to source their own power. And they can do that more easily with a more distributed, less centralized power source, such as a wind farm or a solar farm. Um, so our customers are demanding it, and they can do a much better approach. You know, it's not the same emotional um, calculus that a consumer might do for their home and what goes on their roof. It's much more economically driven. So over the past couple decades, the cost of wind and solar specifically have been plummeting. Mm -hmm. There's been this exponential shift in terms of availability and scale and cost, and it's much easier for a utility or a CFO of a large company or a plant operator to do the, you know, just to do the math, just same way it was for LEDs and that transition. Mm -hmm. These larger companies can do the math and it can be very analytic and less emotional and they can make a shift faster because the costs are there. Not that the emotional, an emotional judgment in this area is necessarily a bad thing. It can go for us too, exactly. No. Yeah. But you're saying at the consumer level, it's much more, it, it's not about necessarily what I can afford, but do I want to do the right thing? Right. And for the utilities, it's a business decision. Absolutely. And, and where is, why is it a business decision for utilities to move in this direction? Well, so where's, the, where's the pressures coming from? Yeah, so it's, um, we're in the midst of this exponential change. We have been seeing costs come down. Solar um, prices have come down 85% in the last decade. Wind has come down more than 50%, starting from a lower number. So two-thirds of the world's population live in a place where bulk power from solar or wind is cheaper to build and get new power from than any other form, including all the conventional forms of, of power generation. So um, when you're in the midst of this exponential change, you sometimes don't see that it's happening, We're, especially when you're getting towards that knee in the curve where things start to really change fast. But we've already moved past the point where, the first tipping point, I would say, where it's generally cheaper to build a new wind plant or solar plant to provide power than to build a new conventional fossil fuel-based power plant. There is a challenge, though, and if, if a particular utility has only recently, last five to 10 years, built a coal-fired, gas-fired plant, to, to come to them and make the argument, you should switch to renewable now when they built a plant that was supposed to last for 30, 40 years. Right. What about that? Well, so I've just mentioned the first tipping point. That's 
the calculus that a company or a utility would make for developing a new power plant. Uh -huh. The second tipping point is coming soon, though, and that is when um, a majority of our locations not only have new power, but existing variable costs. So meaning it would be cheaper to build a new solar farm or wind farm and operate it than continue to operate an existing fossil fuel-based plant or conventional plant. That's not yet. There are parts of the world that that's coming quicker. What does it take? What, what are the variables? Uh, cost. In fact, the, the, the best term that the industry uses is called levelized cost of electricity. Mm -hmm. LCOE is the short acronym for it. And it's a way to look at the total cost of ownership, including the building it, operating it, any fuel that you might have to spend over the life of the project, which can range from 20 to 100 years. Our hydro plants are very long life projects. And fossil fuel plants range in terms of their life. And it can help you make an economic decision for the levelized cost of the electricity you're going to get over the life of that project, which one's the better trade-off. Is GE foreseeing or counting on a time when the U.S. is 100% renewable? So I think there's, that's a good, good question. Um, I wouldn't say GE is counting on that or foreseeing it. There's a whole lot of debate about can the United States do it? When can the United States do it? And I think even people on both sides of that debate agree that getting to 80% is going to happen. It's not that formidable. It certainly will take a lot of investment and it will take some big decisions around policy and grid codes and how we operate. There's a lot of things that will need, us, um, will need to change, but getting to 80% is doable by all intents and purposes. That between 80 and 100, there's a lot of debate and it's not about the technology. It's about economics and policy do we you know and, and timing how it will cost more to do it faster to do it more with wind and solar we need to bring in storage we need to change how the grid operates mm -hmm. it's not an easy quick answer to so, get to 100 so the, the 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 obstacles are not primarily technological at this right. point absolutely not theoretically we could do it tomorrow theoretically yeah but it's a financial It would be question. very costly to do Political it tomorrow, question, yeah. and it would take time to, in, to create the system that would enable it, but mm -hmm. it can be done in short time. And I think the right answer is gonna be different for different parts of the world, based on what their current mix is, how their current you, you know, grid operates, what they're, what they're uh, blessed with in terms of wind and solar and right. hydro resources. So it's gonna happen at different times around the world, but it's not too far off where we're gonna see so the panel discuss, following us is going to discuss Africa, actually. So let's not discuss Africa, okay. but let, let's set up the United States, perhaps as a contrast to what we'll be hearing f further, uh, further down in the panel schedule. But talk about the U.S.'s ab ability at this point to go 100% renewable. Do, do we have strengths and advantages in that regard? So we actually have some of the best natural resources in the world. We, there are parts of the world that have much better, say, offshore wind resources than mm -hmm. we do, or much better solar resources than we do, but not by much, and we've got it all. So we do have hydro, solar, wind. We've, we've got a lot of natural resources to work from. Um, we've got a, a, a grid that will need modernizing anyway, because we're demanding more electricity, we're demanding more operational capability from our grid. We will be investing in digitizing more of our grid operations. So for us to turn that ship is not a huge shift. It's really about investing in the right growth, in the right next steps. And I would say the biggest challenge from an operator's perspective is connecting the country better. Because if you're making sun here and you've got a lot of wind blowing here, but people live over here, how do you connect? Because the sun's gonna be shining for a lot of the, a lot of the time over our time zones and the wind is always blowing somewhere in the US. So, and you've got dams and you've got great hydro resources in pockets. How do you connect that so you don't have these big gaps you have to fill with some other resource? But again, it's, te it's technically solvable problem. Yes. You, when we were backstage and you were listening to some of the conversations happening out here, you remarked, this is really interesting for me as a technologist. I don't get to hear conversations like this very much. What, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, my world is mostly around innovating new technologies to bring the cost down, to um, evaluate how to make things more environmentally friendly. You know, we're, we're innovating around these solutions all the time. Um, to hear the emotional side of the argument is something we don't really invest in our technology to get there, but we see it happen on the side. For example, we, we were the first company to build an offshore wind farm off the coast of the United States. It's just off the coast of Rhode Island. And um, there was a lot of discussion before that when the permitting plan was in place about what that meant for the local fisheries and how would, the, and there was a lot of d debate and discussion where the, the fishermen who used that waters were concerned about what that would mean. And now 
the whole community, especially on the environmental side, is pleased because we've created sort of an artificial barrier reef and the number of fish and the population and the sea life is way better than it was before. And it's a whole different conversation now. That's something as a technologist, I never was a part of, but I love observing from the side because mm -hmm. it just is much more, it helps the momentum of the whole movement. I, I want to invite you now, if you'd like to put in some questions to the conversation, we're going to keep chatting, but as your questions come up, I'll uh, work them into what we're talking about. Um, and again, you, it's very interesting you make this distinction between emotional and economic decision making. Um, and that you see that the, the ordinary person is more operating at an emotional level. But um, I'm not sure whether this statistic has come up already, but uh, pretty reliable polling shows that 74% of Americans support a transition to renewable energy. Um, and that 51% of them said that they would be willing to pay 30% more in their electricity bills to bring that about. I, I'm not doubting the reliability of the data, but I am skeptical about people giving honest answers <laughs> or answers that they'd thought through. But is my skepticism unfounded? Do you? Do well, I do think people are motivated by different things. Um, what I've found to be the case, though, is when I really do talk to people in my community or in my in, you know work environment or our customers, um, people's people's feelings about this as they get educated about what's happening can be driven by a lot of different things. Certainly, a lot of us are motivated by the climate crisis and what that means and what we're gonna do to change our energy mix. But when people find out that the, uh, the economy is really, we've got 11 million jobs in renewable energy globally and in the United States alone, the, for the last couple years, the top two fastest growth, job growth categories was solar installer, wind technician. So when people start to hear that, they think, oh, this might be good for my community, this might be good for the economy, or if they hear about what's happening in offshore and good for the environment, for the fisheries, all these little things can add up. And, you know, my, the Midwest is full of wind farms. My husband's from Iowa, and there's plenty of farms in his, um, in his hometown that have wind farms above the crops now, and the farmers are making a really good income from that. So I think it changes people's feelings when they start getting all these other data points that support this positive momentum. Uh, we have uh, an audience question. When we're saying that renewables are cheaper than traditional power sources, which you said is a tipping point that's coming, are we also counting the cost of energy storage? So I wasn't in that comment, although the cost of energy storage is coming down so fast that there have been auctions around the world where solar plus storage together was the lowest cost option. Mm -hmm. Generally, storage adds cost to put it out of the money when you're comparing it against raw uh, you know, options, but the cost of, 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 power, of uh, energy storage is coming down significantly, driven mostly by the volume um, demand from electric vehicles. In order to achieve 100% renewable energy faster, does nuclear need to be part of the portfolio to overcome challenges from low supply of wind and solar? So, first of all, there's an implicit assumption that there's a challenge from low supply of wind and solar. If you can take that on, and then let's work the nuclear into it yeah. as a backup. So the biggest question, and it's sort of implied here, but maybe a better way to frame it is, wind and solar are variable resources, right. and nuclear would be a base load or a uh, constant. Night, night comes yeah. every day. Exactly, every and night. the wind does blow more often at night in most, most parts of the world, but they can't always be counted on to complement each other perfectly. Um, so the question maybe better, fra better framed differently would be, um, can we really go without some of these really good baseline offerings that can give you energy no matter what? Mm -hmm. Now, something like a nuclear plant, you want to run constantly. You don't want to cycle it up and down only when the wind isn't blowing or only when the sun's not shining. So we have to do a little bit of balancing about our investments and how we want to use some of these other resources. You know, nuclear is a low carbon option, so it, it's not considered a variable it's not renewable. renewable. Though, yeah. It's not considered a variable renewable, but a lot of people think it's good because it's low carbon. I think because we want to do a transition that is um, economically and uh, politically sound, you're probably not going to want to turn off things that you have that are good for your environmental goals. So I would say the question around whether you build new nuclear versus whether you keep nuclear running are very different questions. And is General Electric, is GE involved in nuclear as yes, well? Yes, we have a nuclear business as well. And th there was such a stigma over nuclear 25, 30 years ago. Has that faded? Are we past that or does that linger? You know, it's different in different parts of the world where some countries are really dedicating themselves to growing nuclear and some focus on a new sort of next generation small nuclear, which is a very, very different kind of challenge than conventional nuclear that takes decades to build and the policy and permitting is, is very different. Um, 
But there are countries that are avoiding nuclear completely and focusing only on the variable renewable energy approach. How does GE see carbon capture strategies driven by the oil and gas companies? And are they a competitor re to renewables? So carbon capture doesn't compete with renewables. It is a form, it's a way to reduce the carbon loading from conventional mm -hmm. fossil fuel based power generation. Um, there are costs to that too. And there's a lot of debate over the value or the viability of it in different applications. We don't do work in that space, so I don't have really a lot to say on, on where GE stands, but I think we got to evaluate all options. Will and does GE have partnerships on innovating transmission infrastructure? So we actually have an HVDC business, and that stands for high voltage direct current. And that's a way, like most of our lines here in the US are AC, high power transmission lines. Moving to DC, you could probably put about three times the amount of power in the same right of way. And there's new, and it also helps connect between different regions better. So if we're talking about making a whole bunch of wind power in the center of the country and shipping it to the coasts, mm -hmm. HVDC is the way to go. And that's really a big part of the growth for our view of transmission. Greening power plants is easier than greening transportation. Does the technology exist to get 80% into transport? Is that out, outside well, your specialty? No, I would say the way, to, the way I think about this is how can you move electrification forward in all sectors? So in the transportation sector, it's about moving to electric vehicles. But how do you get the electricity to those vehicles? Are you burning coal or gas or are you using solar or wind or hydro? That's the choice that my work sits on is how do we supply utilities with enough green electrons and hybridize our solutions so we've got wind plus solar plus batteries to give them a more level loading so they can supply these, these automobiles with, you know, these electric vehicles with power and then they can that, that changes the transmission sector. Does the cheaper cost of wind and solar include land costs? It includes all costs. It's yeah. everything. Yeah, for the life cycle of the project, absolutely. I have a ridiculous question. Yeah. Um, I keep saying General Electric, but the name of the company is GE. Yeah. Correct? I'm sorry for that. Oh, that's I, okay. I, but the reason is I played on a Little League baseball team back in the early 60s, uh, sponsored by General Electric, <laughs> and, it, and it's just burned into my head. So then I kept realizing I was correcting myself. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I want to thank you for that. Um, My pleasure. The last thing I want to ask about is we, we're, we're talking about hydro, for example, wind farms. Th there's also concern that these create their own environmental negative consequences, negative impacts. Talk a little bit about that, what GE is doing in terms yeah, of Yeah, so there actually is a great dialogue happening right now. GE is a part of it, but it's much broader than GE. Um, it's with the Department of Energy and some environmental and cons conservation groups and other hydro-based companies. And they're talking about the balance. I mean, there are environmental groups that want to see no new dams built, but we have several dams in the country right now that are inefficiently utilized. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of a give and take. How about we, you know, there's some discussion about, can we come to an agreement about upgrading and improving these dams and removing these. So overall, the net environmental benefit is, is positive, but we also get more efficient use of the infrastructure that we have. So those conversations are very helpful. They're progressing, and I expect good things. Danielle, from the company that used to be General Electric, now <laughs> GE, thank you very much. Thank you.